so IPython and Jupyter are some tools for uh, interactive computing and, um, and doing the interactive exploration of figuring out um, what code you want to write and also for the process of recording what you did and sharing it with others for the purposes of just communication, but also um, reproducible, uh, reproducible research, keeping track of what you actually did, um, making more auditable scientific process, but, and also applications like um, making uh, tutorial and presentation materials like uh, for use cases like uh, classes like this. So what I'm actually going to focus on is the interactive aspect of IPython in particular um, and a little bit about Jupyter in general, um, focusing on how it can actually help you do things like uh, your homework in this class. So a lot of what um, IPython and Jupyter are about is just the process of running code, um, actually running it, figuring out what code you want to run, figuring out why the code that you wrote inevitably uh, didn't do what you wanted it to, um, and then figuring out the process of, of making it correct and, and doing it again and keeping that process of figuring out what you want to run um, and verifying that it's correct and making that process um, as smooth and intuitive um, as possible. So starting off a little bit about what is a notebook. So right now we're looking at a, a Jupyter Notebook uh, web application, like, uh, like you've seen before, but a bit about what, what it actually is. So a notebook document, um, this is peeking at what the actual file that I'm viewing in the browser, what that file actually looks like, um, is it's a, a text file in a format called uh, JSON. Um, that is a serialized, uh, a structured document that contains, you can see that mostly a notebook is a list, um, in Python terms, it is a list of cells. And each cell is a dictionary that has some source that's the input for, for that cell. And you can see this is the content of my first cell. So if I edit this cell, this is a, what's called a markdown cell, where the content of the cell is is actually um, written in a, a language called Markdown, which is shorthand um, for simple HTML. If I double click on that, I can see this is what I actually write. So I, I write some Markdown. This lets me do headers and links and bold text. And I can also inline some mathematics with LaTeX um, using a tool called MathJax. And then when I press Shift Enter on this cell, the browser renders that to HTML. And then I have images, and I have links. <coughs> right, so the first step in uh, a notebook, we've got the markdown cell. The first step is we've got the sequence of cells. So these, with the text, these are markdown cells. So I've written some markdown here that renders this nice, nice HTML. And we have what are called code cells, um, where I can input um, some code in uh, in any language. In this case, I'm using Python, as you see in the upper corner. Uh, I'm using Python 3 here. Um, but I could create a notebook in a variety of languages. Currently, what I have installed um, are uh, Julia, uh, which is a language for numerical computing. I have some Python 2, and then I have a Sage kernel. And you can also have R and um, about 60 or so uh, other languages. And so I can run some simple Python code in this case, and I'm just printing some text. And you see you get the, the, the output. Um, anything that you print um, in the code will come as output in that, uh, in that cell. And you can see that um, output is produced uh, asynchronously. So if I um, print statement, print something every uh, second, you can see that it actually gets the, the intermediate statement. It doesn't actually have to finish executing the cell before you get any of the output from that cell. <laughs> And um, in the context of this document, I have uh, what's called a kernel, which is a process, a Python process that's running. And that's keeping state. So when I declare variables in one cell, those are available um, to the next cell. So I define this variable i while I was iterating. And then I can print i um, in the next cell. And one of the, so that's the basics of ex ex execution that you get um, with Python in general. 
Um, and what IPython does, the I in IPython stands for interactive, is it adds things to the Python language to make um, the interactive process um, more productive. And so one of the things that IPython adds to Python is this uh, question mark. So there are a variety of things you can do with question mark that have to do with asking questions of the state of the interpreter. So if you just run, yeah, I, don't, I know that IPython has some concept of question mark. I want to ask some questions. What, tell me something about IPython. You just run a cell with question mark and you get some information about IPython, what it does, what kinds of things um, IPython uh, can do, can help you with. Um, and basically the contents of this output is the um, part of what I'm going to go over today. It tells you about what IPython can do and where you can find more information. So the first thing that question mark does is introspection. So I have imported an object called a named tuple and I execute um, that object uh, and then with a question mark on the end. And what you get is some inspection of that object. So I can see, okay, what's the signature? Since this is a callable, named tuple takes a type and field names and then some keyword only arguments. And then I can also see uh, the doc string. So for how the author of named tuple um, tells me how to, how to use it. So now I get some, I know I want to create a named tuple, but I don't remember exactly how I should create one. I just run this question mark and I see, oh, here's some examples. Now I know uh, what I want to do. So maybe you have more detailed questions. Say the, the doc string wasn't clear, or in some cases the doc string didn't exist, um, and running the, the function um, doesn't do what you expect it to. Um, the next step is so you ask the question, you ask the polite question with one question mark. Um, if you just add another question mark, then you're asking a slightly deeper question of you know, what, are you, what are you really? So I put two question marks on this uh, counter object. And this time you get the same information, you get the signature. So this is, since this is a class, I get the initialization signature. I get the, and instead of just the doc string, I actually get the source code um, of the object itself. So I can see that a counter object is actually a subclass of a dictionary. You can see what it's for. It's a subclass for counting, uh, counting items. So this is used um, in some, some coding examples called like bag of words. Examples where you want to say, like, count all the numbers, all the occurrences of this word, and compare them to that word, that kind of thing. And a, a counter is just a dictionary where it keeps track of, of occurrences of items, and you can add things, and it just increments counters. So how does it work? You can see it's got an init method. Um, we can see um, it's got a method called most common. It's got a method called elements. And I, so I can create a counter with a string, just with a bunch of letters. And now I can ask, okay, what does this most common method do? And now I get the doc string for the most common method. It says list the n most common elements and their counts. So if I do c dot most common, I can see that a is most common with five occurrences. B is second most common with four occurrences. And I think I can do it with two to limit that to the top two uh, elements. So the next thing you can do with question mark is search. So if I want to search in my global namespace, I can just put these wildcards, the asterisk characters, um, and this will show me everything in my current namespace um, where it matches this, um, this pattern, this blob. And this is useful when, for instance, um, I'm working with uh, NumPy, and NumPy's got a lot of array methods, and I want to say, show me all the things um, that I can do uh, with, with NumPy, where it's maybe converting to arrays or converting from arrays, and this will show me every method or every function in NumPy that has array in the name. And this can be useful for um, if, you, if you know there's some function, you forgot what, exactly what it's called, you know it has this in the name, um, Often people start with tab completion, and that's really helpful if you know how uh, the name starts. But if you know how the name ends, um, tab completion doesn't help you find it. Um, and so using this, this glob matching lets you quickly say, I remember vaguely what this was called, but not exactly. Let me quickly search and, and figure and remember what it was. Or maybe 
you know, I have an array and I want to convert it to an image. Does it say like IMG or, or image or picture or whatever? Um, and you can, you can search with kind of more fuzzy ideas of, of what's going to be available. And then if you run a cell with this um, percent quick graph, you get a quick reference for kind of the kinds of things that you can do in IPython. If you're, um, if you're new to it, if you're getting started, this can be useful to say, like, what can I do with IPython that, that might make my life a little bit easier? So the next thing for poking around um, that I mentioned is uh, tab completion. So if you start typing, so I'm typing np.ar and I hit tab, you get a little pop-up showing all the things on NumPy that start with start with that, and I can just press select things and press tab, or press enter to select, um, and I can um, select the method, and it lets you type a little bit more efficiently. Or um, if you know um, if you know what you want to type, you can press tab um, to just save a bit of time, so you don't have to type every character and avoid typos. Um, and um, if you know only roughly what you want to do, you can use tab to actually say, to quickly inspect. So what are all the things on NumPy? I can tab and see like, okay, just scroll through all the stuff on NumPy. So tab can be used both as an efficiency process for typing more quickly. Um, right, so I just typed ARR tab to tab and I got this whole thing. Um, and so it can be used for efficiency, but it can also be used for exploration. Um, if you know, I want to use this thing, but I don't, what, what methods does it have? Um, that kind of stuff. Um, it can be used for more kind of a, a poking around activity. Um, IPython stores the results. So when you run a cell, when you, if the cell ends, um, with what's called an expression, so something that has a value in Python, in this case 2 plus 10, which has the value 12, um, we get an output, and you see this out 16 here, make that a little bigger, and that's 12. Every time you run a cell, IPython stores that output as a special variable called underscore. So let's say you ran some code, it took a while, and it had a result, and you realize, oh crap, I actually want to use that result for something. The result is available um, as underscore if you want to save it and, and start working with it. But importantly, every time you run, underscore gets updated to the most recent execution. So if I run this again, it's going to keep going up by 10 because underscore is the output of this cell. And this gets to a point in um, Jupyter that some people get uh, have some confusion that the um, organization of the code in the document doesn't necessarily correspond to um, the code as run. So like if you run a cell multiple times, or if you run cells out of order, like you can run a cell at the bottom and then run, set, run a cell at the top, um, that's perfectly valid. Um, and the notebook doesn't enforce that the cells are run in a particular order. And deleting a cell doesn't make that code, um, doesn't unexecute that code. Um, it means that if you run this, if you open the notebook with a fresh kernel and run it top to bottom, everything will be in order but you are allowed to modify the state out of order, uh, which can make the appearance of the notebook uh, a little confusing while you're doing that, um, but it uh, can be really nice and, and really efficient for the interactive poking around of re-execute, the, change this a little bit, re-execute it, and then go down here um, and kind of work in a kind of a scratch environment. If for some reason a, an expression produces something, a result that you are not interested in seeing, you can use a semicolon, um, which is uh, ignored by Python. Uh, if you underline the semicolon, it will suppress that output. Um, but the um, IPython still stores that output. Or IPython, sorry, doesn't store that output um, if for some reason an expression produces a result that you don't want to keep around. And this is common, um, most common with something with a library called Matplotlib that is used for plotting um, that produces images, but what it actually returns is usually a, a list of, of some objects that you're not actually interested in holding on to. So if you've got a cell that does some plotting, um, you might see uh, a lot of lines that end in a semicolon um, on the end of a plot command. And that's what they're doing. They're just, they're just hiding an, an, an uninteresting output. And we also store, I've run them in a funny order, 
so out with the out. So the reason this out looks like looks a bit like a dictionary um, is it actually is a dictionary with the name out, um, and so you can actually out access outputs by their their index, and you can um, view your history with. Uh, if you do percent history, you can see the first five lines that I executed. And then I can say, what, what else could I do with the history? So I use question mark again. And you can see all the things that I can do with this history magic. So the next extension to the Python language that IPython makes is um, lowering the impedance uh, with uh, lowering the barrier between Python and um, the system shell. So one of the, so Python's a really nice language. One of the things that makes um, Python a little bit more tedious than, uh, than other languages like, uh, say, Bash or Perl or Ruby is that it's, it, it takes more typing to execute shell commands. Right? You have to import subprocess and popen and call and these things. Um, and that can be a little annoying if you want to just like um, change directory, right? So um, printing the current working directory in Python looks like print os.getcwd. Right, that's how um, you show the current working directory, but the shell actually has a really quick command for doing that. And so if you're proficient in um, in shell commands, or if you're if you're doing things um, in uh, in a shell context, um, if you start the line with an exclamation point, then um, IPython will execute that in shell in, instead of in your uh, in the Python language. So this lets you easily interleave um, simple shell commands with um, uh, with Python commands, and for a nicer uh, interactive experience where the shell is really convenient with things like changing the directory. Um, listing files, that kind of thing. Right, so I can call ls to list the, list the files in the directory. And then there's also, um, for some of these, there's a shortcut that, where you don't actually need uh, the exclamation point. You can store the output of these shell commands. So I can I here have files equals exclamation point ls. And this stores files as the Python variable files is now the result of the shell command ls, as you can see, it's actually a list containing the entities um, in that uh, file output. And I can iterate through that Python list. So that's taking shell commands and storing them in Python variables. And then the next step from that is taking um, Python variables and using them as arguments in shell commands. And so in the shell, generally variables start with the dollar sign. And so if you have a shell command starting with an exclamation point and you put a dollar sign and then the name of the Python variable that you've defined, then that pipe, the string representation of that Python variable will be inserted into the shell command before it's executed. And you can also use um, what's called Python uh, fancy string formatting. So if you put braces and then you can put a Python expression. Um, and in that Python expression, I'm taking the first item in files and making it uppercase and then passing that to the shell command echo. This can be a nice way of um, non-trivial operations on file names can be a bit tedious in uh, shell languages and more convenient in Python. And so this lets you um, get a list of files um, in the shell, maybe do some fiddling with them in Python, and then do something uh, again uh, back in the shell with the result. And these can be anywhere in the cell. So you can iterate in Python and then have shell commands uh, interleaved in the, uh, in the iteration. And the way this works is because all of these things that Python adds to the, or that IPython adds to the Python language um, are through a system that we call input transformation. So you type a cell um, that you send to IPython and IPython turns that into pure Python. So every time there's one of these magics, um, so an exclamation point or a question mark, it's just turning that into Python code that does something. It's, it's Python code that you would never type, um, uh, but it's, it's Python code and then it just runs it as, as regular Python. And so if we look at um, 
the code that I actually ran, I used this history magic again, and this, this dash t shows the transformed um, uh, results. So if I do history 34, this is the code that I actually typed. This is cell 34. Um, and if I do dash t, that's the transformed version. This is the code that actually executed. And you can see that it called get a Python dot system and then the rest of that line. So the third um, extension to the Python language that IPython does is um, something called magics. And so these are lines, uh, lines or cells that start with uh, the percent symbol. Um, and these let you, ultimately any magic is actually a Python function. Um, but these Python functions are designed to make potentially tedious um, common operations uh, more convenient. And um, in the case of timeit, so the Python standard library has a really useful module called timeit that's used for um, running a bit of code a bunch of times and gathering in, uh, timing information uh, on how much uh, time it takes to execute. This is useful if you're doing um, optimization or measuring um, you know, how, measuring how long this takes, comparing two algorithms, things like that. Timeit's a really handy way to do that. And what the timeit magic does is it takes um, your code and then says, okay, I'm, this, one of the things that's, that's tricky with timeit is you have to tell it um, how many times, what it does is it runs it many times um, and computes some averages, um, but you have to know ahead of time roughly how long it's gonna take um, to know how many iterations is an appropriate number. And so what the timeit magic does is it runs it once, says this takes uh, about a millisecond, so I'm gonna run it maybe a 10 or 100 times. But if this takes about a nanosecond, maybe I'm gonna run it a million times. Because it wants to, every time you run timeit, it should take a few seconds, no matter how fast what you're measuring um, is gonna take. And so if I try to compute a list um, with a thousand elements. It's going to do that for a little bit, do some measuring. In this case, it took about 15 microseconds, give or take uh, half a microsecond, and it ran it um, 100,000 100, times for each measurement. You can also do a cell magic. So if you start a cell with 2% signs and, uh, and then a word, um, then that's, that's going to, instead of measuring the line, it's going to measure the whole cell. And this will be probably similar. And so you can combine, just like with the uh, shallow escapes, you can combine, um, you can run these these magics um, in iterations. So I'm just quickly measuring how long it takes um, to make a list of a given size um, for one to 500 or one to 400 um, uh, items. And you can see it takes about one microsecond to roughly a microsecond per 100, um, per 100 elements. And the scale's approximately linear. But if you, and you can see each of these took, um, the smaller ones took uh, a million iterations because it took under two microseconds. The bigger ones took more than two microseconds, so it ran 100,000. But then if I measure something that takes a bit longer, in this case I'm measuring some code that takes a tenth of a second, it only ran it 10 times because if it ran that 100,000 times, it would have taken hours. So this is, this is what's really useful about timeit is that it, it guesses roughly, um, uh, picks a reasonable amount of time that you want to wait because it's really focused um, on the interactive experience and making that uh, more efficient. So you don't have to think about, oh, this is going to this is going to take um, half a second, so I only want to run it two or three times versus this is going to take a nanosecond, I want to run it a couple million. Um, and an extra zero or two can also be really annoying um, if you do that by hand. And again, in IPython, if you want to ask something, you use a question mark. So we've used timeit a couple times. Now we can say, okay, how, what does timeit tell me about how I should use it? And if you inspect timeit, it is, um, like I said, every magic is actually a Python function. 
So when you inspect a magic, you get you know, the doc string that tells you how to use it, the various arguments it takes, various options where you can um, specify how many iterations if you do want to specify that. Um, these magics are, Pyth are Python functions, so time it takes Python code and modifies how it is executed, um, but the magics can take the cell and do arbitrary things with it. Um, and one of those arbitrary things could be go execute it in a different language. So there are a couple magics registered by default. In this case, the bash magic runs some shell code, um, or it can run some code in Ruby. And what this is doing is it's just instantiating a, uh, running a script in another interpreter and capturing the, the output. Uh, so you can write magics um, that do maybe common actions that you do that IPython doesn't already support, and any um, magic is just a function. So I have a couple magics that I use called um, just tick and talk. Okay, I'm often measuring how long something takes, and I can just make um, put a, a quick magic to say like start a timer here, and then a magic somewhere else that says stop that stop that timer over here and report the time. Um, and that can be that can be convenient in a way that tracking um, you know passing the variable that ha has a handle on the timer around can be a bit annoying. So write file is a magic that takes the contents of a cell and writes it to a file. Um, this can be uh, handy for um, in a tutorial context because it's it's really useful to be able to keep everything in a notebook. Um, so I don't have to open another tab to say I now have a file. Let's go look at what the contents of that file is. Especially if it's is only appropriate for fairly small examples. But in this case, I'm just writing a, a little file and then I can see that I created that file. Um, with that content. And that, that's useful for um, encapsulating um, maybe a couple of little helper files um, that during the process of executing the notebook you actually create those helper files. There is a magic called lsmagic that tells you what all the magics are. So if you want to know what magics are available um, and you can get magics from extensions, um, you can see these are line magic, so the ones with 1% that take the rest of the line um, and decide what to do with it. And then there are cell magics that take 2% um, and um, mod uh, modify what it means to run that whole cell. So if we look at the precision magic here, so what's that going to do? You can see it sets the floating point precision for um, pretty printing. So if I do uh, import math, math.py, you can see that's what um, pi looks like by default. So if I do precision 2, now whenever I see a floating point number, IPython is going to show just to two decimal points. And this also talks to some known libraries. So this actually sets the precision for displaying numpy arrays as well. So one thing, sometimes if you're copying code from the internet, it'll have um, prompts and stuff at the front. Um, or if you're copying code from one shell. So if I'm running terminal IPython, um, then you might have uh, prompts that look like this, and you want to take that code and copy it and then paste it into a notebook. Um, IPython will actually recognize those prompts and strip them off. So this is not valid code. Um, but IPython said, oh, I see that you copied that from a terminal. I'm going to strip that stuff off the front and run the real code that, that I know you meant. And so um, one of the things that, that you do a lot when you're doing things interactively is you do things wrong. Um, so in this case, I've got a couple of functions. I'm writing a little uh, Python module um, that does some, some division. And I call that, and I get uh, an exception. So another thing that, because when you're doing things interactively, um, things go wrong. That's one of the reasons you're doing, you're often doing things interactively is because you're trying to figure out why something is wrong or how to do something correctly. Um, so nice exceptions uh, and rendering of tracebacks is an important part of um, the interactive uh, iteration process. So IPython by default um, does slightly nicer tracebacks than uh, the Python interpreter, but it also has a few options. So if you're really confused about what's going on, 
you can change the exception mode, this thing called X mode, um, change that to verbose, and if you run the same code again, we see at every stack frame, we also get um, the current names and values uh, of the variables. So this is useful for like, why did that do that? You know, what's the value of x here or y? We can see, oh, when I called this, x is 1. When I called this, y is 0. So um, I'm dividing. Um, Um, 1 over 1 minus 1, which is 1 over 0, and so 0 division error. And so the one level is a nicer traceback that gives you more information. The next level after that is um, interactive debugging. So Python has um, a debugger called PDB. Um, IPython extends that a little bit to get you um, uh, an interactive, uh, a little bit more uh, interactive behavior in the inter uh, um, in the debugger. And in a debugger, you can actually, um, so running percent debug says, take that most recent trace back, um, give me a debugger, a postmortem debugger, um, in that error. And I can say, you know, down. You can move up and down the stack with up and down. And so now I'm in this return 1 over x. OK, so why did this raise an error? I can say, so what is x? Okay, x is 1, so that's pretty clearly um, that, that's going to give me, that's you know, what my error is, and I can go up a frame and say what's y <laughs> and what's f. And then you can exit from that session. And you can also just ask the user um, <coughs> questions if you want. So Python has this input function. You can just ask, you know, what's your color, it's blue, and then that gets it as a Python variable. So this is just a standard Python function, um, but because we're running it in the web browser, it's non-trivial. It's not necessarily obvious that some, that certain Python functions actually do work in the notebook, but these basic ones of um, uh, input and debug do work, uh, which lets you do, uh, get input from the user um, as a part of a single execution. I've already seen these. You can have Perl and other things. And the next thing um, about the, the notebook in general um, is plotting. So we've only seen text output so far, but output can actually be in any of a variety of MIME types. So I'm just going to load um, matplotlib and numpy and do some simple plotting. And this gives us um, a plot as a um, PNG uh, in this case. And there are a variety of plotting libraries that work in the notebook. Um, that have varying degrees of interactivity um, and, and quality in different APIs. There are a growing number of libraries um, for plotting in the notebook. Matplotlib is the most common one, um, and in some ways the most powerful, but not the most interactive. So if you want interactive graphics, there are other tools um, like uh, Bokeh, BQplot, um, Altair. Um, there's, there, are, there are a lot of them, and you can, you can look around at some of the fun things you can do. And back to the interactivity question, um, IPython has this concept of widgets. And widgets are interactive controls that, as a part of the output, give you something to interact with. And what you can do is you can, you can decorate a function. Um, so we decorate a function, we import this interacts decorator from IPy widgets, and we decorate a function by using this at symbol. And then we have a function that has a few arguments. So number, the default value for number is 5, the default value for text is hello and check is true, and all it does is print. But when I run this with interact, I get a slider for the number, and I get text, and I get a checkbox. And so this lets you say, I, I have a function um, that I, has some parameters. I don't exactly know uh, what parameters I want to use, um, but I know uh, kind of the range uh, I want for this parameter. Um, this lets you quickly write a function that takes an argument um, and then interact with it so you can say like, oh, I see that the result is what I want when this value is in this range. I know that the result is um, I don't want in this range so that I can um, pick the right value for when I'm running my actual code.
SymPy is a library for doing symbolic uh, computation in, in Python. Um, so it has these concepts of symbols and, and doing symbolic expressions that can do um, you know, automatic differentiation and integration and evaluating expressions. You can interact, um, and one of the nice things about SymPy is that it can have um, representations of mathematical objects as LaTeX. Um, so you can create a SymPy equation object and that renders, that's interesting. Um, so now an equation looks nice in LaTeX. So you saw um, briefly, briefly, um, what um, it's actually outputting. That's the LaTeX expression with those dollar signs. Um, but then the browser eventually, it turns out, will render that as a nice math mathematical expression. And then as we move the slider, what we're doing is we're factoring x to the n minus one, and SymPy is computing that factorization, and then we're displaying that um, as an equation. We can see how that behaves as you change the value of the exp exponent. And you can see that it's just evaluating to true when x to the n minus one, because it's, act it's actually exactly the same uh, on both sides, and then it just replaces that with the value true. Um, because both sides are identical rather than equivalent. Right, so that, I think, is about the end of the first uh, segment. So we're going to start out um, importing some uh, NumPy and matplotlib, and then here I'm importing a package called Seaborn. Um, that is in part just to make matplotlib uh, look nicer. Um, and we're going to be mostly using timeit, which we uh, talked about in the previous notebook, which lets us um, measure um, really quickly, do some, do some basic measurements of roughly how long something takes. And so we can see we're just computing the, uh, taking some square matrices um, and then dotting them with themselves to get a rough sense of a 100 square matrix um, takes you know 55 microseconds um, but a 2,000 square matrix takes about a quarter second and based on the, you know, the amount of time each of these takes then um, you can see that uh, that time it chose a different number of loops for each one just to make sure that it, none of them took wait none of them took too long but also none of them um, were too fast such that they um, were measuring the numbers that are too small. You need to something needs to take a certain amount of time for um, a, uh, a measure, computation uh, performance measurement to be meaningful because there's you know a lot of things going on in a computer. So accurately measuring something that only takes a few nanoseconds, um, you're not going to get an accurate measurement um, when you just if you just do it once because actually the process of taking the measurement takes a bit of time. Um, so you want to make sure that you're anytime you're measuring something that it takes at least a second. And we can see all the different things that time it can do. We can ask for specific samples. Um, you can run it as a cell magic, etc. Um, so we can specify. In this case, we're using this dash o flag to store the output. So a time it result actually is an object that records um, a bunch of information. So I want to store the output. Um, I want to run it once um, with 100 repetitions. And now I've got a time it result object that took 81 microseconds on average, give or take um, um, 16 um, for standard deviation, 100 runs, runs with one loop per sample. You can see what's the best result in that sample run, what's the worst result, so I can see the range. And then I also have every run, so this is 100 uh, values. I can use that for histograms and things. So here I'm using a uh, the matplotlib histogram plotting function to show for this um, for this function I ran it measured it a hundred times roughly how long um, how long did it take and you can see that most of the time it took seventy to eighty um, microseconds but sometimes it actually took three times that long um, and you can see of the rough uh, distribution of how long something takes. So this can tell you, um, time it will tell you, give you 
an estimate of, you know, this is the average time, this is how spread out it is, um, but you can actually, if you're interested, you can use TimeIt to capture all that information and do more detailed plotting of, of, of how that, that performance behaves. So um, what we're, the uh, process we're going to be optimizing is the diffusion of a 1D wave. Um, so we, because you know, taking the full advantage of um, our uh, notebook with its uh, mathematics and everything, um, we're going to create a sawtooth wave, which this is the mathematical expression for a sawtooth. Um, and I'm implementing that. Um, I can just import the sawtooth from the um, sci-fi signal module. And you can see here's our, I'm storing t is our um, x -axis, time axis, and then x is our uh, sawtooth wave. Um, and I plot that sawtooth, and uh, steps we'll use later is the number of steps that we're going to diffuse. And then our diffusion equation, our 1D diffusion equation, um, here's the, um, the mathematics for that. And then when we discretize it, a uh, second order, um, it's called a second order finite difference um, approximation of the diffusion equation is um, this expression where for each iteration um, you um, take the previous value and then you do um, a, a convolution of um, that of the value at the previous time step and the two um, neighboring uh, values and that that creates kind of a smoothing process uh, that diffuses the, the wave over time. So if we implement this mathematics, this xk equals 1 fourth times um, the previous value uh, minus 1, twice the previous value at the same location, and the previous value um, to, uh, to the right, and then these boundary conditions, we can implement that in Python to say, so start out with a copy, um, we make a new array, um, that's the same shape and uh, type. We apply our boundary conditions. These are our boundary conditions. And then we go through a number of time steps. And then we go through every element um, in our array. And then we set the value equal to 1 fourth times 1 to the left, 2 in the center, and 1 to the right. And then we swap our temporary variables um, as, as we evolve, so that x is always um, k minus 1 and y is always k. So we can run this blur. Oops. Helps if we run the definition first. Run this blur. This is what I mentioned about the um, semicolon. So this is, if you have a plot function, plot call at the end, that expression has a value that's um, a relatively uninteresting list. If I put a semicolon there, and run it, then that little list is gone. So here's my original input wave, this dotted line. And then my diffused wave is the green line. You can see that we're, we're, kind of, we're smoothing out the wave. And what we're interested in, um, in this exercise, is the performance of this diffusion. So here we're storing, we're running time it, and we're storing the result. And then we're just running that blur. And then we're going to store as this t, this reference time, the best run uh, of the bunch. And then we're going to store that in a list um, and call it the Python run. And so you can see that took about, about a second. We can, um, I believe you've seen with um, NumPy that one of the quick ways to uh, performance optimization of element-wise operations in Python is to use um, NumPy um, and do an, a, a process through a process called vectorization, and that generally means you take um, what in, in algorithmic terms is a for loop, and then you write that as a single uh, NumPy function call or a single NumPy expression. And so if you look at the Python implementation, you can see you've got two for loops. We've got one that's through the steps. That's an algorithmic one. 
and then another that's, iter that's an element-wise iteration through, I have to iterate through all the elements in X to create Y. So I can take the same code in NumPy, the beginning is the same, setting up the uh, boundary conditions and the initial uh, Y, and then I've got my iteration through the steps, now that's the same, but I've replaced my for loop uh, with a single expression or single uh, uh, assignment. And so what we've done is we take, um, it's the same algorithm, you take it one fourth times um, the, uh, all the elements up to the, uh, excluding the last two, and all the elements excluding the first two, and then two times all the elements from um, the second one to the second to last one. And what this is doing is in a single NumPy expression, it's doing that same operation for every element. It's saying every element should be that value, um, two times that value, um, plus one times the value on either side, um, averaged. And it's doing that in a single expression um, with these NumPy slicing operations. And we can see, we can verify that that produces the same result. Graphically, we can also do it numerically. And then we can time it again. And plot the result. So now we're recording the time it took for NumPy to do this. And we're plotting the times. We can see that NumPy was approximately 100 times faster than Python, just by changing one line. We saved uh, about 100 times. This is a, a log scale. So this line means it's 10 times faster. Um, and this line means it's 100 times faster. So smaller is better. You can see the speed up. Yeah, 67 times. That's not too bad. Not, not too bad for, for one line of code. But now where we're getting um, into the IPython um, process, uh, we're going to try optimizing again uh, with Cython, um, which as I understand you learned a bit about Cython last week. So Cython provides an IPython extension. Um, and so we load extensions by saying percent load EXT, um, and then you give it a Python module name. So Cython is the name of the, the Python module. With that, imp it imports Cython and then says Cython can define its own magics uh, for IPython. And so now I have this Cython magic, this percent percent Cython, um, that does interactively, it takes that cell compiles it with Cython, and then imports it back in. So you don't have to do like command line Cython dash uh, inline and all that stuff. So I've defined a simple sum function. This is pure Python. I'm just seeing how well can, uh, can Cython do uh, to take a pure Python function and make it, make it better. I can time summing 0 to 5. It's about 400 nanoseconds. I can do it in Python, so the same, same code. Um, but the really useful thing uh, in the notebook is this Cython-A, which is for annotate. And what this does is in addition to compiling Cython, it generates HTML that shows you information about the code that it generates. So what Cython does is it takes um, annotated Python and generates um, C code. Um, that's a, accessible to Python through the Python C API. One of the things that can be tricky with Cython is that it's, it's not always clear which lines of code are really efficient pure C and which lines of code are just as um, complicated and potentially slow as the, the if, if you'd run it in Python. What this annotate does is it shows you exactly what code is generated by each line of Cython and um, it has an intensity of yellow that corresponds to how much Python API usage that corresponds to. So you can see this white line is nothing, but this iteration, we can see if you click on it, it expands to a whole bunch of mostly unintelligible um, 
Python C API calls. And the important thing here is that just more yellow is slower. That's what we care about. We want, we're optimizing for less yellow. So you can see that this iteration for i in range n um, is, there's a lot of Python code involved in that because it's actually calling the Python function range um, and storing temporary variable i. Now, um, Cython optimization, and this is true of optimization tools for the most part in general, that the optimizations have to do with the more information that the tool has um, about what it's going to be doing, um, the more optimization it can do. Um, so we didn't tell it, we didn't tell Cython anything. We just said, this is some Python code, do. Um, it didn't know what n was. So it had to, because it doesn't know what n is, it has to fall back on the pure Python when calling range, it has to do exactly what range would do if you give it, if you gave it an arbitrary Python object called n. But if we annotate it and say, Cython, n is gonna be an integer, I promise. I should also be an integer, and this is where we use cdef, to say this should be a C integer, I'm not a Python variable that should be accessible to Python, just a purely internal variable um, in the generated C code that's an integer. And now we've still got the same for i in range n, but now Cython knows, it knows that if i is an integer and n is an integer, for i in range n, it knows how to turn that into pure C. It doesn't call any Python anything. There's still Python here. So CS is a Python variable. Yeah? Is it possible to compare levels of yellow across different cells? Or are they relative? So just saying something about the... Uh, or you understand what I mean? Um, so these are uh, talking about comparing levels of yellow across different cells. So these are totally independent functions. Um, you can inspect it to see what the actual value is. It's really just a line count on um, the intensity of the yellow. Okay. Um, in this case, it's two. Um, and if you inspect it, it's actually got a CSS class of like Cython level two. Um, direct comparison is a little bit tricky. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're mostly eyeballing it and trying to get rid of the really bold uh, yellow parts, mostly from the body of the function. So we can see that our for loop is now, the actual iteration part is pure C, but the body of the for loop still has quite a bit of Python code, Python API code. And that's because we haven't pulled it with CSs. So we can run it again, kind of fully annotated. CS is an integer, it starts at zero, I is an integer, iterating. Now what does this look like? We've actually gotten rid of um, we've gotten rid of Python API calls everywhere in the function, uh, with one exception, and that's um, the function definition itself, um, which needs some Python code in order to be a callable from Python. Um, unless you're writing just a Cython function that will only be called from Cython code, and then you can get rid of it entirely. Uh, but since we want to call this function from Python, the definition itself needs some, some Python, but we've actually gotten rid of um, any Python API calls um, from the body of this function entirely. So now we've got a few implementations of a sum, um, three in Cython, one in Python. Let's compare them uh, in their performance. So we're gonna run them all um, with uh, a million iterations. We're gonna do it in Python first, it takes about 62 milliseconds. Um, then we're gonna do it in Cython, yeah, let me save 20%. Um, second optimization, uh, a little bit better. And then the third operation, a million times better. Uh, yes? Shouldn't we have changed the parameter as well? Change the parameter? Um, uh, in this cell? This one? Yeah. 
This one? Uh, no, int, uh, you only need cdef for um, new variables. Yeah. Um, so when it's an argument, basically there's an implicit cdef here. Okay. Um, Can you be sure of that? Yes. Yeah. Um, but so it's for declaring new variables you need cdef. Um, but function arguments are, by being arguments, they are already declared. So you're only adding the type. Yeah. So what what this what this yellow is doing is making a Python function that takes a Python object n and turns it into a C integer, and then does the rest with a C integer. I do I do have to, I did have to say it's an int. Yeah. So that this. I just didn't need, for um, minor syntactical reasons, it doesn't need cdef. Yeah. Um, it just needs the part after cdef. Yeah. So if I, um, if I removed this, it would be horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, time and clock. So there are, if you look in the Python time module, there are lots of timing functions. Um, there is one, I think the one that is recommended now is, I believe, perf is, counter. yeah, perf counter. Yeah, perf counter and process time. Um, yeah, you can look in the, in the documentation. For the most part, they, they, for measuring large enough values, they don't usually differ. It's only for the really high precision um, and this is one of the reasons why time it makes sure to run a pretty long time. Um, and it uses the appropriate value um, internally. So time it is a module that just returns a number. We're trusting time it to use the, the appropriate um, uh, timer function internally. Um, and I believe it's using perf counter. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, when you're timing your own things, um, there are um, two generally two kinds of measurements. There's measurement of the actual time it took from beginning to end. Um, and then there's measurement of the, the actual time that the process spent doing work. So that excludes time that the process was maybe waiting for something else. Um, and those can be, sometimes you want one, sometimes you want the other. It depends on what you're measuring. So here we see in our results, we did quite a bit of optimization. We got rid of most of that yellow, but there was still a little bit of yellow in the inner loop um, in our second optimization. But going from P sum to C sum 2, we saved, uh, I don't know, maybe a third, um, from 60 to 45 milliseconds. Um, but by getting rid of that one last thing, so if we compare um, this to um, this, really the only difference is um, that we put a cdef on cs. We cdef cs, uh, cdef in cs. It's the only real significant difference. Um, but that difference was a uh, million times factor of uh, performance. Um, because you really want to get, um, the really important thing is to get, if you can, all your Python out of that inner loop um, for performance. So just, Cython's not um, not a magic optimization tool. Um, you really need to tell Cython um, the right things to get it to, to go fast. And these, this Cython-A is a really useful tool to kind of verify um, whether, you've gotten, um, the, whether you've gotten the Python out of the important parts. And then time it lets you verify that you got the performance you expect. So if we use that same um, technique in our blur, we can go back to our pure Python implementation and do blur Cython. This is exactly the same as the Python code passed to Cython now. And we can see we've got a lot of um, a lot of Python in our in our loops. And then we can run um, the Cython. So how much how do we do on just regular Cython. Well, it's not it's not quite as good as as NumPy. You know, it's a little bit faster, but didn't really help. But now we know from the the simpler sum example that that's because our inner loops are our loops are still uh, full of Python API calls. So if we can um, annotate those um, to get more um, to get more code out of those loops, 
um, then we can um, we can we can do a bit better. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to cdef our iterations. So there are our our iterations are now pure C for loops. You can see just just a one line pure C for loop. Um, but our inner operation is still that um, that uh, Python expression. So you can run this. Second operation. And you can see we've actually got about 25% um, speed of improvement just by making sure those for loops were, were in C. So that's pretty good. Um, but we're not, you know, when compared to NumPy, it's not, uh, not so great. So the next step of uh, optimizing Cython is that the, um, optimizing with Cython is all about telling Cython what generally what types, what shape uh, these things are. So we tell Cython that x is going to be a NumPy um, ND array of um, floating point, double precision floating point numbers, and it's 1D. We say, Cython, this is going to be a 1D NumPy array. And steps is, is an integer as well. Um, and then we, again, with our, um, our, inter, our temporary arrays, we say these are also um, double arrays with um, this dimension uh, with, that are 1D. So now, how does Cython, knowing that all these, all these um, array variables are 1D arrays of, of doubles, um, can um, Cython do a better job with that inner loop? I see it did a mostly better job. There's a little bit. There's this. There's some. These see these unlikely checks. We can say we're raising index errors. We can say this is checking if the index is um, greater than the. Um, uh, these are what are called uh, bounds checks. So. <laughs> If you're if you're writing C code and you've got an array that has size ten, and you say array eleven equals five, um, in C what that does is catastrophic failure, um, and in Python um, catastrophic failure is not so nice. So Cython says, okay, I'm running this code. I don't know um, how big these arrays are. Um, so every time I'm doing an element assignment, um, I can do that in C. But first, I need to check if that's going to uh, crash. And if, it, and if it would crash, I'm going to raise a nice uh, Python error that's saying that you know, index error, that's out of bounds. And so we can see how we do with this. All right, now we've beaten NumPy. So that's pretty good. It's just it's simple. We just said these are NumPy arrays. As you're iterating, um, should do um, do this, but there's still a little bit of Python in there, and that's doing bounds checks. Um, now, a, a slightly advanced um, Cython feature is to say, "Trust me, I know what I'm doing. I know I don't have any index errors. I'm not going to make my code assign outside the array." Cython, turn off those safety features and don't check that my indices are valid. Let, let, me, let me just, trust me, um, there are no bugs in my code. Um, don't check, don't give me nice errors if it's wrong. Um, die horribly if it's wrong. And here we see we've actually gotten Cython entirely out of um, all of the loops. And this is uh, because all the Cython that was left was saying, if you're trying to assign an element um, outside the array, raise a nice Python error. We just said, trust me, Cython, I know what I'm doing. Um, and then Cython said, OK, all right, fine. I'm not going to do that. Um, and what you end up with is, is pure C. It's relatively convoluted, but it's just some temporary variables and then an assignment. Yes? Let's say you actually gave it one parameter assignment, What would that actually mean? Uh, the kernel would die. The process would exit. So you have to reload the entire thing. Yeah. Um, 
we can do that at the end and see what happens. Um, but I want to keep my state for now. Um, but yeah, if you just if we just had um, in this for i in range n minus one, this is a really common error. If it were for i in range um, n, it would like if I if I left out this minus one, it would fail, um, and the process would exit. Um, if I did it in in the previous Cython, I would just get a nice index error. Um, uh, if I did it in this optimized version, so it's a good idea to not have turn off that bound check, to leave those bound checks on until you're sure it's right. Um, because you'll get those nice errors and you'll fix those errors. And once those errors, once you've actually convinced yourself that those errors are gone, you can just put these switches and then get a little performance boost. So now that we've gotten all the Python API calls out of the inner loop, we can run that and see the result. There. Now we're slightly more than a thousand times faster than the Python and uh, slightly more than 10 times faster than NumPy. And this is because um, in the NumPy example, we had that expression that had you know, the different slices of NumPy, and that's creating temporary uh, variables. And so doing that um, three element um, operation, each time you do that, you're allocating new arrays. Um, and so that's where the kind of last 10% of the NumPy operation is the creation of these temporary arrays um, for the right-hand side uh, of the NumPy implementation. But for the full Cython version, um, we're not creating any temporary arrays. We're only creating temporary um, uh, scalars, um, which is much faster. And just verifying that we still get the same result. We didn't, we didn't cheat and just skip doing anything. Uh, this is this is the result from the fully optimized version that it really is the same. So that's kind of the process of interactively figuring out um, how to optimize a function with Cython, how Cython extends the notebook and gives you a really nice experience for interactively optimizing, you know, fiddling with things, tweaking them, comparing them um, in the notebook, and then um, we can move on to Numba, which it uses something called a, a JIT, which is a just-in-time compiler, which um, uses a um, trace of um, calling a function to basically take all the things that we did about telling um, telling Cython what everything is beforehand. Numba tries to do that automatically. So it says, this is the pure Python code, perfectly unchanged, and then we're running it, and then let's see how Numba does. So not bad. It was faster than absolutely everything except for our um, maximum optimized um, Cython, um, and that's possibly because it's also doing the bounds checking um, that our, second, our penultimate Cython was doing um, to get nicer errors, and the reason um, so the way Numba works is it's, it's doing all the things that we did by hand of saying, Cython, this is a 1D NumPy array of doubles. Um, this is iterating through just a simple integer range. What Numba is doing is saying, it's like it's calling the function once, and as it says, OK, this is a 1D array of, of, of doubles, these are all also num, uh, 1D arrays of doubles. I'm iterating through a simple integer range, and it's doing the same optimizations that we did with Cython but it's detecting them as it runs and saying, oh, this is an array, do the fast thing with an array. And then if you call it again with a different type, it can do a similar optimization for a different type, or if it doesn't know how to optimize it, it will leave it as the pure Python version. And so Numba is using kind of the current uh, uh, compiler uh, uh, state of the art of um, all the manual optimizations we did in Cython, it's doing them um, uh, a bit uh, all, all by itself, and Numba has its own system for telling it things. If it if it's if it's interp if it's guessing isn't good, there are ways to tell Numba uh, more. Yeah. Is there a way to get feedback from Numba to Numba? Yes, um, I don't remember how, um, but yeah, yeah, Numba will tell you uh, um, the kind of the AST that it that it broke down. Um, I think if we 
look at um, what do we call it? We call it a blurred number. Let's see. Yeah, so you can see that this blur number function actually has a bunch of um, yeah. So this is the L LVM bytecode <laughs> um, and annotations of the compiled uh, number that number generated automatically. Um, I'm sure there are better methods for doing that. That's what I get from a couple seconds with tab completion. So yeah, a lot of these um, methods are not on normal Python functions. They're added by the number decorator. So another piece in um, profiling, so we did, we did a kind of primitive a priori profiling with Cython of where's find the yellow and make it go away. Um, profiling is a more realistic um, way of saying, actually run this code and then tell me what pieces of it took, took all the time so that I can figure out what pieces of my code I should be focusing on for optimization. This can be really important if you're optimizing a big application and you're not actually sure uh, which pieces of it are taking the time. So um, I have a simple script called profile me that walks my temporary directory. Um, you can, with Python, there's a built-in module called cprofile that you give it a script and it runs that and it tells you a bunch of information uh, about you know, which function calls took time and, and everything and it's a bunch of information not especially well organized. You can also run it as a Python library. Um, and the nice thing about running it as a Python library is that when you run a script, it also includes a bunch of time about imports, which you may not be interested in. Um, but if you run it as a function, then um, all the imports have already happened, so it's not measuring the imports anymore. Um, it's only importing, it's only measuring the expression. Um, and you can see a little bit of information about what's taking the time, and you can dig into this. Um, and IPython has a, a magic that basically does exactly what um, that profile run did, but as I say, the magic, so given a Python expression, um, run it with the profiler and give me the profile results. But that's not the most uh, useful way to present that information. There's a handy tool called SnakeViz that does the exact same thing, um, but when you run SnakeViz on it, it did the same run, produced the same information, but then made it so that it was um, a little easier to uh, see summaries about what um, is actually taking the time. So this is the exact same information as that uh, little plain text table, um, but now I've got a starburst chart to say, um, okay, I'm spending um, about half the time doing um, plain iteration. I'm spending some time checking if things are links, spending some time um, iterating through directories, and some time checking if um, uh, building path strings with path.join. You can see which um, functions were called, um, how many times they were called, um, and how much total time they took, etc. And you can use this to find find the hot spots in your code to say where um, you should be doing the optimization. So if I've got a block of code, I can use a snake fizz as a cell magic, and this is just finding everything in user local. Oh, really done. Oops. So this is just finding all the text files and then computing uh, an MD5 hash uh, of those. It's just doing various work of, of different sorts. And now I can see, and then for debugging purposes, I'm printing the, the path that I'm currently working on just so I can see the progress and I can inspect, okay, what takes the time? I can see I'm doing most of my time is, in, is actually in iteration, just iterating through the files, then I'm spending some of my time. If I look, um, So I can inspect, so what is the fraction of times in the iteration, but then if I look more into what's inside the iteration, I'm spending a certain amount of my time reading files, a certain amount of my time opening them, 
spend a certain amount of my time actually printing my progress. So I could actually save um, uh, a certain amount of performance just by removing that old debug statement because it's taking a non-trivial amount of the time. Snakefizz is a handy profiler. There's another um, package called Line Profiler um, that lets you, um, you, it's similar that you're running, um, you're running a bit of code. Oops, that was actually wrong. And it, um, that one doesn't produce interesting results. And you can see it takes that function and then breaks it up line by line and then shows you where you're spending all your time. You can see I'm spending 75% of my time in that inner loop line, but I'm spending 25% of my time um, in that, uh, in that uh, second uh, iteration. And so this is actually that 25% of time that we got from our first um, Cython optimization. We got by annotating our loops, um, got us exactly this 25% uh, performance improvement, but because we did, weren't optimizing this line, um, we were still spending that much time. So this, this line profile actually explains um, the performance difference in our Cython, uh, one of our Cython optimizations. Um, and now we can also do the same thing with uh, Numba, and we can see the um, one of the downsides to the magic um, uh, JIT code is that now using tools like line profiler say none of these lines were called um, because in actual fact the code that was run was this generated uh, internal number stuff and not the Python code that we wrote. Um, so things like line profiler is no longer a help because we have no idea what code was actually running. But we can look at the, the NumPy example and you can see that we're spending all our time in NumPy expression, which is what you want, right? If you've got a nice single NumPy expression, you want all your time to be spent there because that means that you're trusting NumPy to do a good job, which is usually a, a, a reasonable thing to do. Um, we can also profile um, just computing a dot product. So this is just dotting uh, an array with itself. And you see that this is not super informative because we're, it shows we're, we're, all, we're spending all our time in um, dot, which we knew because we called dot. Um, and the reason for that is because dot is um, one of the reasons that NumPy gets uh, the performance that it does is that many of its functions are compiled C functions. And these Python profilers don't cross the Python C boundary. They only profile Python code. So once you get to a C function, that's where the profilers stop. Um, and so you can't use these Python profilers to profile compiled Python methods. And NumPy dot is an example of one such uh, compiled method. Okay, and that's the end of the optimization. And I just wanted to show some a couple demos of, of things you can do uh, with notebooks beyond this kind of interactive Stuff one is um, NB Viewer, um, which Simon uses to share uh, share notes. So you can take one of these JSON notebooks, which if you look at the raw notebook is not super intelligible. Um, if you um, put it anywhere on the internet, especially GitHub, then you can go to NB Viewer and then input a URL of any notebook on the internet, and then NB Viewer will take that notebook and convert it to an HTML page. So if you've got any notebook, you can put it anywhere. Um, and then if you want to show that notebook to somebody, they don't have to have uh, Jupyter installed or anything. You can just give them a URL to NB Viewer, and they can say, oh, that, you know, that notebook's interesting. I won't, maybe I want to download that. Um, and so they can just click the download link to download the original notebook and run it if they're interested in. Um, but they don't, need to have the, they don't need to have the notebook in order to just look at it and see if they're interested. And in this case, if it's on a GitHub repo, there's a link. Uh, to the repo where that uh, notebook resides. And GitHub renders them as well. A, another thing I wanted to mention is a, a project 
um, that we're working on called Binder. And um, what this does is kind of like NB Viewer. Um, you give it, you give Binder a GitHub repository that contains some notebooks. So I'm going to enter the uh, a repo um, that I made called um, uh, LIGO Binder, and this is um, I don't know if you people know. If, I don't know if you guys know about the um, uh, LIGO experiment uh, measuring uh, direct op uh, observation of gravitational waves, which won the um, Nobel Prize in Physics this week. Um, so the LIGO Open Science Center, um, for every event they observe, they publish um, the raw data sets, and they also publish uh, Jupyter notebooks um, to go through the analysis that they did to say these um, wobbles of mirrors with lasers means uh, black holes happen, um, and or black holes collided in a, a little spiral. Um, and so they publish those notebooks, and they publish links um, to binders so that you can just click a link. Um, actually, why don't I just do that? So at the LIGO Open Science Center, they have a little tutorials page. And then you can click this, this link, and you get the binder. And then it builds. Um, uh, an image for you, and then we have our own little notebook server. See, this is running um, at this is running on a public server um, at Binder, and I can go through and edit and um, what, follow along um, with the LIGO analysis. Um, it takes a little while; it's a big notebook. And what this does is it, it actually goes through all the analysis, explains some of the math, um, parses the the data sets, generate some plots, does some signal analysis, explains how some of their signal analysis works. And that's, that's why I made my own, <laughs> um, because mine runs in Python 3 and also has interactive widgets. So this is the kind of thing that you can you can do with notebooks. It's not just for that that interactive uh, scratch environment or doing your homework. It can also be used um, when you're doing actual science. Um, you can communicate your results and make them accessible uh, to the world using uh, using notebooks. <laughs>